Right next to me, I've got an intern who did a thesis. Um, he started uh, looking into the security model of uh, solar, panel, solar panel converters. And um, he found some astounding problems. He went public just last Friday, and since then his life is completely full. <laughs> he's yeah. been called from all over the world. So he's got something to show us. So let's, let's hear it. Here is uh, Willem Westerhoff. So welcome everyone. Uh, it's nice to see yeah, a pretty decent crowd since well, the announcement was five days ago. I think you knew it the same day I did, which was quite weird actually. Um, today we're going to talk about how an intern, being me, hacked the power grid. Uh, I call it the horror scenario. So who the hell am I? Uh, my name is Willem Westerhoff. You probably never heard of me before because I just got out of school in 2016. This was my final assignment uh, coming out of the school banks. I studied system and network engineering, uh, yeah, graduated with honors, and I'm currently working as a whitehead at IT Sec Security Services. It's pretty nice, pays the bill, keeps you, keeps you out of jail. So if you're a good hacker, please let us know. We still need some nice pen testers. Uh, what I do for a living is basically pen testing. Uh, when we don't have any projects, I focus on password cracking, and every once in a while, I'll do some consultancy for companies. And in the past, I did some network monitoring, but that rarely ever happens anymore. So tonight's content. Uh, I'll first show you some context, uh, how I did this, why I did this, what's the deal. Then we'll talk about the concept, uh, what's the, yeah, the bottom line of this attack. Then we'll look into the theoretical approach and try to see from a theoretical perspective how to prove this. We'll then look at a practical approach, actually hacking some stuff. Uh, then we analyze the results of both, uh, make a conclusion and some expectations based on that. And then we'll continue with the ongoing discussion in politics right now. So some context. When did I do this? Um, I started summer 2016, and I finished January 2016. Uh, I responsibly discos to Defender somewhere in December, prior to Christmas. So yeah, that's pretty interesting. Why did I do this? Well, my boss had a hunch, and he said, I think if you hack solar installations, you should be able to have some kind of influence on the power grid. Could you try and see if that's actually true, and whether you can do that? Now, I called it the horror scenario. That's not without a reason. Um, Horus is somewhat of a childhood fond memory of my mine. Ironically, I lost a necklace with Horus sign on it in Egypt. So, yeah, sad parts. But uh, it also stands for the god of the heavens, where his right eye is the sun and the left eye is the moon. And when the moon moves in front of the sun, we call it a solar eclipse. And what we're trying to prove in this scenario is that if we using software create a solar eclipse, or in other sense, shut down PV installations at a large scale, we could kill the power grid. So the hypothesis I'm trying to test is that photovoltaic installations connected to the power grid and the accessories they come with contain security vulnerabilities that allow hackers to influence the power grid in such a way that you can have power outages occurring. So the basic concept, well, you have PV installations, sun shines on solar panels, this goes to the inverter that converts it to electricity, and that's supplied to your household appliances or directly to the power grid. So it creates energy, basically. But the thing with the power grid is it has to remain in a constant balance at all times. Uh, supply has to exactly meet the demand. And, and so we have many uh, countermeasures in place so that if a, an energy central fails or a cloud moves in front of the sun, the grid stays up. But uh, yeah, with that constant balance, if you change the balance enough, you create a large enough disbalance in it, shit's g going down, uh, stuff's happening. We've seen it in the past. We had a five gigawatt outage in Germany, and we had cascading blackouts all across Europe. That was 20, uh, 2006. So 
really the scale is key here. If I unplug my own inverter at home, nothing's happening. But if, if I unplug a thousand inverters, or maybe even a hundred thousand, that's when stuff gets rolling. And with more and more of these devices being connected to the internet, and also the rise of the internet of things, so we have a ton of vulnerable equipment standing right next to these inverters, uh, this is becoming a very real threat. Because yeah, we have so much PV power right now that it's, it's almost more a realistic scenario to attack PV than to attack uh, large-scale power plants. Well, then look, let's look at some theory. Do the math first. Some statistics. I, uh, we, we didn't have exact numbers, so I used some information from the Central Bureau of Statistics in Holland and combined those with the distribution of sunlight across periods of time, uh, weather reports over 30 years, yada, yada, yada. And out of that came, uh, using some assumptions and using a lot of formulas, we could calculate that about 4.3% of the Dutch power grid during those peak sun times is running on solar energy. Now, that d number doesn't say that much, but that's equivalent to 1.33 million households running on solar energy. And that's every household in the seven largest city in Holland. So that's quite a lot when you look at it that way. But the Dutch power grid doesn't have that much PV installed. The thing is, we don't have that much. We mainly use windmills. So if you look at another grid, the German power grid, and we do the same, and we also compare it to official sources, we can see that 35 up to 50% of the German power grid is covered by PV power at those peak sun chains. And as you can imagine, if you take out a third or up to half of a nation's power supply, that's going to be a very real threat to the power grid. But with Europe as a whole, um, we can't see those nations as being individual. We are constantly importing and exporting power towards each other. Uh, Germany is pumping PV power to us. Uh, France is pumping nuclear power to Germany. Uh, we're constantly moving energy around. And there are also agreements that should a uh, shortage occur somewhere, other nations will help fill that shortage. <coughs> so an attack on a single nation, or even across Europe, will affect other countries as well. If one goes down, they all have a very serious problem. And with Europe having most PV power as a continent as a whole, yeah, we're most likely going to see an attack here, but China, for example, with their current solar energy goals, and the United States, who also have a lot of PV, could see similar attacks. Now, then when we look at the power grid regulators, we don't have an official number uh, where yeah, the, the grid fails. There are different experts who say three gigawatt, possibly five, those are the ranges you should be looking at. But yeah, we don't have absolute security in that. But let's face it, if a nation loses 50% of their power near instantly, there's no recovering from that. You can't have that much power on standby. You can't make gas turbines, coal turbines go that fast. It, that's just not happening. So another way of looking at this, because we don't have the definitive proof from statistics, is by comparing it to a solar eclipse. Now, the 2015 solar eclipse happened across Europe uh, in the morning, this was an event they were fully prepared for. They had extra regulations, extra manpower, uh, guidelines on how exactly to uh, yeah, manipulate the power in the, in the grid in order to survive this. And this event took two to three hours. It followed a perfect pattern. It does affect all PV installations. So yeah, a hacker probably won't be able to do that. Uh, but this attack happened in the morning. So this is as the sun was rising. And various sources state that if they hadn't prepared accordingly, there's no way that uh, the energy sector would have survived. There's also big solar fields which were um, afgekoppeld. I'm not sure about the, the, uh, the English words. Disconnected from the power grid at the time in order to not cause that much of a disbalance. So when we compare that to a cyber attack, this is not something they are prepared for. They don't have that amount of countermeasures. Um, they don't have extra manpower. They don't have a plan on how to deal with it. It's just completely unexpected. And instead of taking two to three hours to cause these dips and rises, we're looking at 
maybe a minute to shut all those devices down. So this peak is going to be very, very steep. And instead of following a perfect expected pattern, as long as I control the on-off switch, that's a pretty random pattern. I could just yeah, configure the devices any way I want to keep switching on and off. Now, based on what we've seen, I expect that about 50% of the PV installations can actually be hacked, which is quite a large number. And this attack will likely take place during peak sun time, not in the morning, so you can have maximum effect of those that PV loss. Now, if you look at that graphically, the top one is the solar eclipse, the bottom one is yeah, a theoretical case. Now, at the top one, you see the steep decrease. Uh, yeah, it goes like this and then back up again. They barely made it through that. The bottom one shows a dip. Now, that's where I basically shut the power off. It fails. When it then moves back up, or I turn them back on, it comes back up. I turn them back off, and now I leave them off. So the other energy suppliers, they start stabilizing the grid, entering uh, extra grid power, gas power, coal power, and they stabilize again. Now, when everything's stabilized, I turn all switches back on. So you get a nice over peak. And now, normally, these devices would yeah, automatically shut down from the grid. If there's too much voltage on the line, they just they cut out. They say, no, I won't do this. But those parameters, in some cases, can be set by the hacker. I can just tell the device, don't stop doing anything until there's 900 volt on that line. So they'll stay connected, and you can actually cause that peak. And after that, you can go back to your dip again. And yeah, that's the game we're playing. But the thing is, I can shut those devices down and back up faster than that they can regulate with gas and coal sand. So if we look at this comparison, yeah, the easy conclusion, the cyber tech is worse. And any power grid that has a lot of PV power is going to be affected very heavily. This, this will be bad. But due to the intertwinedness of those power grids, any power grid that fails with a lot of PV in it is also going to have a significant effect on its neighbors. If Germany fails, there's a good chance Dutch, French, and Belgium will also fail. So really, you're looking at the shotgun approach. Hit everything you can in Europe and see if whole Europe goes down. So to conclude on the theoretical part, statistically, yeah, there's a very serious impact. And yeah, realistically, we can expect to see power failures. And when we then look at the comparison, the cyber attack is way worse. So we can expect very large scale power failures. And then I'm talking nationwide or even up to continental power outage, large cities going down instantly. So theoretically, this yeah, is pretty possible. Now that's all fun and games, but without vulnerabilities, we have nothing here. It's, this is just math. So for the practical approach, I first started by looking into some open source information. Uh, what kind of test setup would I, would I need? Which devices are yeah, most present? And which devices are the most secure? I also looked into laws and certifications. Uh, what kind of laws do exist? What can I expect from these devices? Will we see um, yeah, very heavy certifications implied, which means they need to be pen tested, they need to have security measures or not? I also looked at some technical documents of the test setup. Yeah, what can I expect from these devices? Then the normal behavior, based on those open source info and some observations in the field. So we determine, all right, how does this thing normally work? And then we do some, start doing black box testing. We just dive in and start hacking the ever living daylights out of it. And we'll see where it takes us. So the test setup selection. I did it based on some criteria, market leaning and best secure device. And there was a very simple reason for that. Um, if I can hack the best secure device, or at least what's renowned to on the internet as the best secure device and also the market leading device, I immediately have a, a relevant amount of devices. And I can state, well, if the best secure one is very hackable, then the rest is probably worse off. Now, the selected test setup, any PV module, it didn't really matter what's lying on top of your roof, but the inverter below really matters. Um, you need to have a, an SMI inverter for this test. 
because yeah, that's the market reading. He has, they have been that for various years. They've openly talked about security and be, that being a yeah, top issue for them. So that's the one to go to. Now we had a real life test setup, 161 PV modules on the roof, two different types of SMI inverters, and this was a 75K installation. And if I broke it, I had to pay for it. Well, I was a broke student at the time. <laughs> so as you can imagine, I didn't try burning the thing down, fuzzing it aggressively, hitting it really hard with aggressive scans. It's mainly passively found vulnerabilities. So if you happen to have a house where we can hook one of these up, please let me know, because I, I'd love to try. <laughs> Now, some cybersecurity measures during law standards for PV installations. There are different standards that you could use, but none of them are actually obliged. You can use whatever you want or don't use anything at all. It's up to you. So the expected cybersecurity measures is yeah, little to none. No one's enforcing anything, so. Huh? Then the test setup specific, SMA is founded in Germany, it's a German company, most of those devices are actually made in Germany, so they have to uphold the German cybersecurity law, which is in effect, I think, start 2017, so they have to have a minimum security. So another reason why we should hit SMA instead of other devices. And there's also an interview with an SMA spokesperson. In this interview, they say, yeah, security is becoming a top priority for us, and now some other stuff, but the key word here is becoming a top priority. <laughs> so when you read between the lines, I'm thinking, well, they have some security measures, but they're probably not where they should be. And as I'm reading the technical documentation, I come across the password policy, and I see default password 000, installer password, default password 111. Okay, <laughs> interesting. Now, if we then go to the normal behavior of the device, it uses SIP to communicate outwards. Now, that's a notoriously hard to implement protocol, but for some reason they chose it. I don't know why, but that's what they use to communicate with their servers. They also use SMA Data 2, which is a custom protocol made for local communication, as well as a Modbus interface, which is optional. You have to actively turn that one on, so you won't see it that much in a while. It also has a, a specific operating system, probably some Linux kernel variant, uh, which responds to DNS, ICMP, ARP, and IGMP v2. Now, if you look at it from a graphic perspective, this is a lot of information to take into, but don't worry. We'll start at the top. <coughs> Let me just take a drink first. So if I have my device, my laptop or my phone, I have this nice monitoring app, which is cool. And this thing communicates with Sunny Portal, and Sunny Portal sends a SIP message to my local inverter. This local inverter then yeah, deals with this message. This comes back to Sunny Portal, and Sunny Portal shows it to me. So that's the normal way of doing things if you use your phone or your app to check on your PV system. Now, another way is using Sunny Explorer. That's a management console mainly used by installers. And that one works on the local network. So that one works either over Bluetooth or over uh, the SMA Data 2 Plus Ethernet link. Now, there are also other tools, APIs, that sort of thing. Those mainly run over Modbus. Some of them run over Bluetooth, but mainly M Modbus. And then on the local inverter, you have a specific SMA operating system and also something called a grid guard, which is yeah, an extra security layer for the most sensitive settings out there. And what I mainly tested are these three parts, the SIP communications for external communication, the Sunny Explorer application itself, and the SMA Data 2 Plus protocol. Now, why? Because these are used by all these devices. Sunny Explorer is specifically made to work with all SMA devices. So yeah, anything I can find in this will be the most interesting for doing this at a large scale. And what I would have liked to do but didn't do is the Modbus port, testing the other tools and APIs, and testing the underlying operating system. Why didn't I do it? Well, one, I ran out of time. 
I had so much and yeah, there was no stopping me anymore. And second, I didn't need anything else. I had everything I wanted. So why bother attacking the Modbus when I could do anything I need to from the SMR port, for example? And what I didn't test was Bluetooth. Simple reason, I don't want to be physically close to every location in Europe, and I can't be. <laughs> I wish I could, but yeah, sorry. And then you have the Sunny Portal, Sunny Places servers. Those were formerly out of scope. Of course, I did sometimes rattle it a little bit, check some passive scanning, look at it that way, but I couldn't actively target those systems. But they could very well be vulnerable. So for the field test intros, it's, it's just too much to discuss right now. I can discuss everything I did, uh, but I won't. What I'll show you today is an old but very relevant finding. I'll show you one with full technical disclosure about finding information about these devices. I'll show you how to exploit them with passwords, but not in a technical sense. I'll just name the findings. And I'll show something about how to exploit them via the firmware. Please note, I'm not giving full-on technical details today. I agree to that uh, yeah, under some pressure of various government parties. Uh, likely, I'll be disclosing those full-on technical details on Black Hat London if they'll have me. So we'll have to see. So the old but relevant finding, CVE 2015, this is a pretty old one. SMA Solar Sunny Webbox has hard-coded passwords. They have an interface which you can sign in and it has a hard-coded password. And actually, since we released the information about SMI inverters, there are 6,000 less of these on the internet. We had 16, 17K almost of these devices still on the internet openly. Now we only have 10,000. And please note that behind every web box are, in most cases, several inverters. So you can just gain access using this old vulnerability. And yeah, here you have your first 10,000 at least inverters, probably. 30, 40,000. Now, finding information. This is one of the findings that I'll give full technical disclosure on. Nice overview. Again, we start by monitoring with the apps. So I sign in to Sunny Portal, and I have my burp intercept here to <laughs> in between. I sign in. This comes back. It's all nice. It's all good. I see my interface. Now, I send a request to get my event log. It looks somewhat like this. <coughs> this is pushed to Sunny Portal. Sunny Portal changes this to SIP communication. This goes to my local inverter. And at the end of the line, I get back my event log. And this stays some nice errors because I was testing. Yeah, that's what happens. But if we then go to this intercept proxy and we change uh, yeah. this part, it's some weird ID. And yeah, this moves again, but instead of going to my inverter, it goes to another inverter. Well, that's mighty interesting. And instead of getting my own event log, I get an event log that so shows some email addresses, a serial number, a firmware version, uh, whether they will sign in with GridGuard or not. So I have an exact clue on where I want to and what kind of device they have, what kind of firmware version they're running, what their email address is. So I'm a happy man. Now, that ID looked pretty hard, and it, it should be by all means. But here's the thing. Th we have public pages, and in that URL, you can find this nice planned ID. So you can just make a little scraper, get all those ID, get everyone's email address, serial number, firmware, and you're in. Now, this vulnerability was fixed, well, days after I reported it, and they actually crashed their system with it. So that's pretty good of them. Uh, by all means, I think SMA is pretty pissed at me, personally, because I'm disclosing this. Um, but they did pretty good. They invited me to come there, talk about their vulnerabilities. If you want to hack solar panels, do it with SMA. They're pretty friendly in how they deal with you, until you call the media, that is. Then they don't like you anymore. 
So another way of doing this, exploiting via passwords. Um, passwords, yeah. As I said, the policy was interesting. What I didn't tell you yet, there's a maximum of 12 characters. A maximum, not a minimum, a maximum. We can also only use up to three special characters. And I mean, you can only use a, an exclamation mark, an at sign, or a question mark, for example, and everything else is out of the question. And yeah, there's no, yeah, I can set the word A, just the letter A, and that's it, that's fine. Uh, a, 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 it's all good. You don't need any requirements whatsoever. Now you can sniff these passwords as they move across the line, which is interesting. You can sniff them on localhost. Uh, you'll find them plain text. You could sniff them as they move across the network. Then they'll be encrypted. Yeah, encrypted, but a very simple algorithm. I won't get into the details of that, but you could also brute force them. Uh, they don't have any lockout, so you can just guess away and see where it takes you. And the thing is that most installers use a single password for all their installations. So if you find the one belonging to your installer, you automatically have the password for all devices set up by that installer. And another fun thing is that if you're a user, you can just call your installer and say, hey, can I please have my installer password? Because they're obliged to give it to you. And you automatically have the same password for all those other devices. Now, CSRF was also an option, CSRF, uh, cross-site request forgery. You can also lure a user into using a program and then clicking on your link to reset the password, uh, both for the user and the installer account. You could also call, make any other function calls that way, depending on what you do. Then the master passwords, uh, SMA formally denies the existence of these things. Um, user enumeration is also in there. You can find about a dozen more users than exist in the GUI. And yeah, this, this is not a password you can set. So that has to be the same across almost all inverters. And I actually cracked one of them, which works in every inverter I've encountered so far. So the rest of them I d deliberately didn't crack because I kind of don't want that information. But it's a very real problem. Now, in order to exploit these to actually shut down the inverter, you just have to change the right settings with the rights you have. You can do it as a user, as an installer, or as a grid guard. Now, the exploit via firmware, you don't need any user credentials for this. And it actually uses one of those non-existent secret passwords. But it flashes the firmware successfully. You just need to pass the checks to win. So if you look at it, we have a local device. We just go to the SMA site, we download some firmware. It's as easy as that. Do make sure you have the right for your kind of inverter, of course. Now this moves back to your local device, you downloaded it. And now on this local device, yeah, reverse engineer it, create your own firmware. Make sure you pass those checks and yeah, then you can have your own firmware. Now from that device, I did it via the GUI here. I won't show you how to do it in other ways. I'm just signing in with ASDF, 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 because that's a wrong password. So you see these locks. That means I'm not signed into those devices. I don't have any rights. But nice of them to have this device update button at the top, which I can still click. So I have this version here. I'm opening that. It passes the check. I'm hitting the next button. and. Yeah. <laughs> following that, we get this nice thing that says the following update file has been loaded to your system. Now, and there's many more where that came from. Uh, we have other discovered vulnerabilities, which I am not talking about today because they're not interesting enough or this talk isn't long enough. There are other expected vulnerabilities in the attack scenarios I didn't test or because of the limitations I had in my test setup and my uh, yeah, constraints in general. And there are also several untested attack scenarios, the Modbus interface, uh, the server. There are various ways of doing this. So to conclude, yeah, SMA devices contain vulnerabilities and they're everywhere. And you, that way, you can allow, uh, you have control of stopping and starting power output 
either with access rights because you've gained them or without them. It doesn't really matter. You can have that power. Well, then we analyze that information we now have. We can generalize in a way. We've actively tried to target the market leading and uh, the most secure device out there. So if that one's already vulnerable, the rest probably isn't any better. And that's a bold statement to make, but based on yeah, what I can see in the news, possible 100,000 solar meters vulnerable uh, citizens of MR victim of a data breach due to solar panels. Now that nice little Shodan search, uh, which is over 9,000 on vulnerable SML web boxes. And, and then don't even get me started on the tweakers.net comments because I don't know how many of you are hobbyists, but I think you've done more research on those things than I have because the comments are just filled with other vulnerabilities in different types of inverters. I actually had some emails coming in of people saying I couldn't get them to listen to me. Could you please try and get them to listen to me? Here's the information I have. So if it's theoretical po a possibility, and if it's practically a possibility, then every indicator I have shows that yeah, I can do this. There's no indication that I can't. So yeah, what should we expect from when this happens? In the best case scenario, someone's going to look like that at the power grid controllers. And I won't have enough devices, the power stays on, and following this attacks, vendors see the problem and start patching as soon as possible, because they now see, oh shit, we have a very real threat here. Now, in the worst case scenario, I do have enough devices. Now, that means power outages are going to occur. And due to the import and export, they're not going to occur locally. You're going to see power outages happening across Europe. Germany will probably take the largest hit, but Spain, Italy, uh, Holland, France, everything is going to have a very serious problem. We'll likely see cities like Madrid, Berlin completely in the dark. And also, if you have enough power lost this way, the frequency drops to a point where other devices, like windmills, like unaffected solar panels, uh, also stop working. And they automatically shut down from the grid, so you actually amplify your attack even further. Now, the financial impact of that, I used a tool called Blackout Calculator. It's sponsored by the EU, so it's reasonably reliable. If a three-hour outage occurred on the 16th of June uh, in the Netherlands, we're talking about roughly 150 million euros lost. If it happens in Germany, we're over 800 million. And if it happens across Europe, we're looking at 4.5 billion euros lost. So we're talking hundreds of millions, if not billions, in damage here. And that's before we start talking about indirect effects, because looting is likely going to pl take place. It's happened before. Uh, hospitals whose emergency generators suddenly fail. That sort of thing happening. Uh, yeah, we have seen loss, in life, loss of life even in Amsterdam when just the transformer house stopped. And that sort of thing will also happen. So to conclude, under the assumption that SMA is in fact representative for the sector, and we're facing a technically skilled and resourceful attacker. And yeah, the people who actually want to do this are probably pretty capable of doing it. Let's put it that way. Under that circumstances, my hypothesis sorry, is confirmed. So yeah, that's a very, very real scenario. And my recommendations would be that, first off, PV companies start securing their devices, because yeah, that's the main problem here. Government officials should start demanding that these devices are secured, not just PV installations, also windmills. Any device that somehow supplies to the grid, and actually, in my personal opinion, any device that's attached in any way to a network should have some kind of security implementation. And for consumers, if you don't actually use your interface to the network, please just plug it out. There's no point. You're not using it, but yeah, guys like me are. <laughs> now, for further research, there are probably a lot of guys in the room, and girls, I can see a few. Not that much, but a few. <laughs> um, if you want to do some further research on the dev these devices, please do. There are many brands who haven't been thoroughly studied yet, because, yeah, I have a limitation in time and money. 
So that's where my research stopped. But there's probably far more vulnerabilities that still need to come to light here. Now the discussion, uh, the open discussion, what's currently happening is that they're having a discussion in, political, in the politics, can an attacker actually compromise that many devices? Will it actually work? Is he capable of doing that? And that seems very odd to me because the question we should be having is why are we allowing insecure devices on the power grid? If a power plant has insecure devices, we'll never take it. And yeah, can an attacker compromise that many devices? Well, I think enough of you know what a botnet is. I think enough of you have a clue how to get into a, a, an access point, into some network environments. So it's, it's really a matter of time and dedication. And I might not be able to get it on my own, but for example, um, I'm not sure about the name, but the hacker group in Russia, I think they have a pretty good shot at doing this. That's it. Do you have any questions? Okay. Very good talk, thank you. Thank you. Okay, questions. We have quite a lot of time for questions, so let's hear it. First microphone here, or were you first, sir? I'll, I'll take the last microphone first. You. Me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, regarding these uh, SMA devices specifically, uh, isn't the real issue here that they're phoning home to some central server? Like, what's the security of that server? Um, I don't know, because it's out of scope for me. I didn't have permission of SMA to test it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all I can say I about mean, it. I mean, I'm a uh, 100,000 devices, maybe it wouldn't like cause widespread grid failure or something, but it would sure easily get quite messy. Yeah. Especially if you say reflash them with a firmware that constantly cycles the power on and off. Yeah. So, like, why do they even design it this way? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> I wasn't in the design team back then, but it's a pretty bad choice. Like, I mean, does it does it really matter the security of the devices when you can just compromise the central server? Like, you, the design is just uh, wrong from the beginning. Yeah, I agree. Um, but there isn't a much better way of doing it because they have to update firmware as well if they want to have that internet connectivity. In my opinion, they either shouldn't offer the internet connectivity um, or have a very safe way of doing it. And that means just following the best practices and not implementing some yeah, halfway protocol. OK, the microphone here in front. Sorry. One, um, one more question, sorry. Uh, like, uh, if you compromise the central service, uh, would you be able to access all panels, or does it, uh, it, does, does it uh, requ require you to enter, actually authenticate to the panel from the client to be able to access it? I can't like, say. Does it trust the server? I can't or does it trust the client that's talking to the server? It has trust in the server, based on what I've seen in network communications, uh, but I can answer that question fully. Okay, the front microphone. Okay, you, you, uh, you've shown that you can own uh, the box, um, and you can access to it, but can you actually turn it off? Yes. It, it has, you've, you've tested that you, turn off the, you can turn off the power. Yes. Now, I, I haven't tested turning off the power across Europe. I've tested no. shutting down an installation. <laughs> <laughs> Let me be very clear on that one. I guess we would have noticed. <laughs> OK. Yeah. The end microphone. Uh, what I have is not really a question. It's more based of um, uh, you talked about that 4.3% of the power in the Netherlands is solar. Yeah. Um, what a nice idea is that, if, I think it was 2009 when an Apache helicopter flew through some power lines near Zalbommel. Those power lines at that point supplied 5% of the power to that region and all power failed. Yeah, no, so that that's could a, be a, a good pretty good example. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the microphone here in front. Hi there, thanks for the talk. 
Uh, I was wondering if the entire communication and controls uh, are actually going through the cloud platform of SMA. Is that correct? Is there no other communication towards the grid? Um, the inverters respond on um, the power on the grid. So the frequency and the voltage okay. that's on the grid at that point, they respond to it. And the other communication has to be either locally initiated by yeah, the communication protocols or maybe externally using the SIP communication. Uh, but that, again, that's the server I couldn't test. Okay, so they are also talking SIP towards the server of SMA or of the provider? Yes. Of SMA, okay. So um, could you actually say, I mean, uh, using like a, a cloud platform for managing your devices, I mean, that sounds like, uh, you know, those shitty IoT devices you got at home, which talk, which are being controlled by a cloud platform. Um, is the provider, uh, the, the SMA provider actually sending controls towards the devices using that channel? Like power grid controls? That would mean would I don't think so. I think under normal circumstances, um, they only read out the devices. That said, it doesn't mean you couldn't do that. Because there is also, uh, it's actually one in the, I think this one is not in the CVEs, but it, because it's already been discovered by someone. But they also use an old OSIP library. Uh, so you could have remote code execution that way on the device. So the providers didn't outsource their controls no. of the... Okay, no, they have it in-house. Thank you. Okay. The microphone in the back. Uh, hey, thanks for the uh, cool talk. Um, Thank you. I, I was wondering uh, what was the support from the university uh, on disclosing this kind of stuff because it's um, actually massively critical. Yeah, the university was basically held their mouth shut during the time, which was nice. They were under the same responsible disclosure period as I was, and even following that, they were silent. Uh, mainly the role in, yeah, putting everything out there is played by ITSEC and myself, and the Volkskrant, of course, who yeah, made the original article, and from there it took on its own life. I've seen my name on uh, Arabian websites, on Japanese websites, it's everywhere right now. So, probably an NSA flag somewhere by now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably, but I'm, I'm surprised actually, because you have a lot of support, I think it's OS3, right? It's, sorry. O OS3? Uh, the education system network engineering. No, it's uh, I'm from the Hogeschool, Hogeschool van Amsterdam. All right. The HVA, and yeah, I, I don't really have that much with the education program. It was all right for the time being, but I'm glad to be out of there. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Thanks. We have a question here up front. First of all, thanks for a great presentation, and uh, clearly you can t exploit these vulnerabilities if you wanted to and you've captured some of the nuance of uh, power grids. Um, and focusing on the Netherlands, since we're here, um, do you have a sense of how many days a year that proportion of PV power would be vulnerable to, um, not to exploit, but that would cause a cascading failure? Uh, because you've done a lot of fantastic research into the volume that you're capable yeah. of and, and captured some of the engineering I as well as the exploitation. exploitation. So It's actually uh, in uh, the model I created, uh, I take specific days, uh, an average day in a month. So during that month, it should be possible. Uh, main months are May, June, July, August. But in February, for example, we had a pretty day in February uh, in the German grid. I was there at that point. I was mm. at the vendor, which was yeah, surprising. But we still had, even on a sunny day in February, there's over 20 gigawatts of PV energy in the German grid. So given that you've really captured a nuance there that most people don't want to appreciate, have the grid operators started to appreciate that there are some days they're more vulnerable to this type of attack than others? Yes. Um, the authorities are taking it yeah, pretty seriously. Uh, they've spread my report, including the technical details and the full calculations to different agencies and also the energy sector. Um, some of them currently state, but that's probably for political reasons, as I can understand. 
yeah, we're capable of dealing with a little swing. That's not a problem. But they also state this will be very challenging if it actually happens. But the main discussion they're having right now, which is you know, sad for me, is can a ac hacker actually do this? Will he get that much presence instead of having the discussion, shouldn't we be securing these devices? Thanks for being another example in how a hacker could if they chose to. Thank you. Okay, um, we have some more questions to the microphone in the back. Um, so I think the discussion you see happening um, is also a legal issue because in the Netherlands at least, the grid operator does not have the authority to influence what a customer puts on the grid. So I agree with your solution, we need regulation, but um, realistically, wouldn't you agree that the best that the grid operators right now can do um, is discuss, is this realistic, when can we expect it, rather than uh, how can we do something we're not even legally allowed to do? I honestly disagree with you. I think it's important to weigh the risk as well. Um, but we're currently shifting responsibilities. The government says we can only advise the sector. Uh, you, know, you just said that the sector cannot legally do anything about what the users do to their devices. Vendors saying, well, the user should be the one securing their devices. It's not my problem. And the user is saying, well, I'm not a security expert. How the hell am I supposed to do this? And that is a very real problem we're facing. And so have you thought about um, the potential of e so so i'm doing research in a slightly related uh, sector on uh, electric vehicle charging which has similar issues and when i talk to vendors there their main problem when you mention regulation is oh we can't do that because then our chinese competitors will push us out of the market so and and the effect dutch regulation would have is um, well, PV vendors just won't sell in the Netherlands anymore. Yes. So and any regulation should go through the EU. Any ideas on how to get them to listen? Well, this is part of that. Uh, putting it in the newspaper was also part of that. We're trying to yeah, make the problem known and get some political pressure on it as well. Uh, it's not for nothing that my final thesis actually went across Europe and not just didn't just stay in the Netherlands because of it. Okay, thanks. Next question. Uh, are you aware of the 31C free talk, uh, Scalar Strange Love, Too Smart for the Grid? No, I haven't seen it. I've just arrived tonight. Uh, I'm very sorry, I'm really busy right now, right. as you can imagine. It, 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 um, it, 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 back then, uh, in 2013, uh, 2014, they were um, estimating that they could turn off uh, inverters uh, accumulating to around uh, 8 megawatt. Okay. That's... Uh, okay. Thanks. And one last question. Hi, my name is uh, Marek Seger and I am from SMA. <laughs> Hi, Marek. Hi. So, <laughs> thanks for coming. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, thank you for your work. Um, but uh, there are some issues. I have to clarify some things. Uh, the one thing is uh, Willem tested one particular type of uh, an inverter which stands not for the, the whole German or worldwide um, power input. Okay. So it seems that he is making the assumption that um, his vulnerabilities um, uh, affects the complete PV market, uh, for example, in Germany, it's not true. Okay, I'll get back what, to you on that. What um, we have, one fact, very important, 
how much inverters are internet connected from SMA? What do you think? How, how, how much, how many percent have an internet connection? 60, 70 percent, my oh, estimate. It's 30 percent worldwide. Sir, do, do, do you, you, do you actually have a question? <laughs> um, maybe. Uh, um, one moment, please. Um, and from this part, from this 30% of all our inverters, and we, we don't cover 100% of the market, um, only a little part uh, was tested, the inverter uh, which is uh, affected here um, is only one little part of this 30%. So I am not sure if these conclusions are correct. Okay. Is it okay if I talk now? Yes, of course. Okay. okay. So um, I agree for parts of what he's saying. I tested on two types of inverter, not one. Uh, I actually yeah, read the SMA statement today uh, that four different ranges of products are vulnerable to these attacks. They've technically verified that. I'm not sure whether that is correct or not. It could be a political statement. I don't know. There are also some other inconsistencies in that report. That said, I tested SMA because I thought it was the best secured one. This is not a personal statement or a stab to SMA in any way. Uh, what you're saying is correct. I'm assuming that if you're the best secured ones out there, the rest is probably worse. Probably. <laughs> oh. Yeah, thank you. But, but this will be the last question. Then. I mean, ju just a brief comment. Create, I, I, create I have, a sorry, I, sorry, no discussion here. Yeah, the question is, uh, did, you, did you test this type of uh, your inverters, your tested inverters uh, in, Sh in Shodan? Yes. How many did you find? 10,000. 10,000? Actually, during the thesis, 17,000, but since the article, 6,000 were removed it, of it's, the web it's, boxes. It's nothing for the grid, nothing. It's, Just a comment from it's, the it's worldwide, worldwide. Yeah. Just 10, a comment from the company, create a small representative test bed and let people like him test a small regional or small village test bed where you have several products installed in actual operation. Let them hack it and guarantee that there will be no legal repercussions if they take it down. This is the way to ensure security, to do real yes, life tests of your products. I'm sorry. I... In a safe environment. There's another talk coming after this one. I have okay. to close down this discussion. Sorry. OK, thank you. OK, I want a big round Give of applause, applause for both SMA <laughs> and for Willem. Thank you all. <laughs>